um, come out today. Um, this weekend was a big weekend in our community. We have a graduation ceremonies, and um, there's a couple in our in our church that are or have already graduated. Um, ben and uh, Ben Dyer, and um, so we want to give him a big uh, congratulations right now. Uh, he's graduated. He w- w- went through the Liberty um, Homeschooling Network, and now he's already enrolled, taking classes at. Liberty University, and uh, yeah, so give it up for Big Ben, and um, let's remember the Dyer family. I, I don't guess you care that I that I that I mentioned this, but uh, I got an email. Uh, I guess it was yesterday, um, but uh, Renee um, she lost her aunt uh, to colon cancer, and then uh, all within like the same day. 12-hour period, uh, she lost her very close cousin who died of uh, complications from uh, amputation, leg amputation. So um, Renee and Ben are going to be traveling out to Colorado, flying out there, and then from there flying down to uh, possibly going down to El Paso. So there's going to be a lot of traveling compounded with all the just the sadness and mourning. So if you just think about the Dyer family, please be praying for them. Um, as, they're, uh, as they have a, a hard week ahead of them. Uh, if you are visiting with us, we are so glad that you have joined us today. Uh, we ask that uh, if you're visiting, that you would fill out a connection card and place that in the offering plate later on as we take up the morning offering. And, uh, but I'm just so glad to have you all. Uh, today we're actually starting a new series, and I'm excited about this uh, series that we're going to be doing, and it's called What If? You know, the world, the life that we live in our world really is just filled with what if scenarios? What if possibilities? And um, I'm sorry, it's, it's acting up here. You know, you, you think about, even in our own lives, we think about things like, what if I had said that? Or, or what if I had done that? Or what if I hadn't done that or, or said that? We always wonder what, what the outcome could have been possibly been. I mean, we think about it even in our, in, in our world of, of um, current events or even things, historical events. Like, you know, one of the things I think about is like Leonard Skinner. Do we have any Leonard Skinner fans out there? We have a few. All right, good. Yeah, there we go. Um, one of the things I think about is what if they had, what if their manager had booked a, another show there in South Carolina and they wouldn't have boarded the plane or if the pilot had put enough gas in the, in the plane, they wouldn't have crash their plane and we could still have Ronnie Van Zant and those guys still around even today. And who knows the kind of music those guys could have produced. Uh, you think about even like back in 9-11, there's so many what if scenarios. If, if, the, if, the, if it was raining that day and they had to ground the planes. And I mean, there's all these what if um, scenarios. Like Billy Graham, think about this. What if Billy Graham, when he was 16 years old, he didn't go to the revival there in Charlotte to listen to the evangelist Mordecai Ham and give his life to Jesus Christ? What if in that prayer meeting they had prayed that night that, that, some, that, they, that God would raise up an evangelist to reach the ends of the world and that that person would be from the Charlotte, North Carolina area? Do you know that story? What if that prayer hadn't gone out? And again, like I said, there's all these what-if scenarios for us um, personally. And I'm convinced, too, that even in our own lives, that there have been missed opportunities. Missed opportunities that we think maybe, what if? But now it's too late to go back. This what-if series that we're going to be starting today, that we are starting today, really is just taking a look at three Old Testament characters starting today. And looking at the opportunities that God presented to them and some what-if scenarios. These opportunities they could have walked away from, but rather they chose to embrace these opportunities. But what if they didn't embrace them? These challenges and opportunities that these Old Testament characters face are different on the surface for each one of us, but they are inherently the same. Each of these opportunities, they present challenges, requires faith, trust, 
perspective, vision. All of these opportunities that we're going to be looking at with these three guys, they were, they were different. Each one of them, each were, was different, but it all required something very similar. And the same for us today. And I'm really excited about this series. Forty years had passed. They waited that long to get to where they were. The place they were at was all too familiar. Not much had, of the landscape had changed in 40 years, except this guy was now 40 years older than before his mentor, Moses, had died. Looking out over the expanse of the wilderness and over the Jordan River that now separates Joshua and his people from the land they could have had years ago, I can only imagine Joshua replaying in his mind the heated disagreement 40 years prior to this account. That disagreement that happened between the 12 spies that Moses sent out 40 years before this. He sent out the 12 spies to spy out the land, to see what kind of land it was, to see what kind of landscape it was, to see what kind of people and and army and soldiers and all of the the power that they had. And, And all of the 12 spies came back and talked about, wow, how fertile the land was. How incredible the land was that that God had led them to. And they all praised it, but the 10 of the 12 spies said, "But, but Moses, there's an incredible problem here. There are giants in the land. There are giants. Yes, there's all, yes, we get it. God had promised this land to give to, to, uh, to Abraham, to give to Abraham's descendants. And yeah, we get it. God has led us up to this point. He's delivered us from Egypt. He's delivered us. He caused Pharaoh and his army to drown in the Red Sea. And he's led us up to this point. But we got an enormous problem ahead of us. And that there are giants ahead of us. All of the 12 spies, but two of them, said, we can't do it. And the only two that said, we can do it, we've got this, God's on our side, are Caleb and Joshua. So I'm sure Joshua was replaying this disagreement in his mind. And now, 40 years later, you know Joshua had to be thinking, what if we had chosen to trust God and just cross the river and take the land? I mean, think about that. What giants are in your life right now? What opportunities are in your life right now that you're just, you're too timid to to just jump out and see what God not only can do, but will do in you and through you and around you? You have all these promises that God has, he's with you. He will never forsake you, right? And so this is the same scenario that, that, that the people of Israel face, that Joshua faced. And Joshua thinking to himself, what if we had just obeyed God? We could have been in this land 40 years ago. Rather than seeing an entire generation die off in the wilderness. But now they have another opportunity and God has presented them the opportunity, has presented the opportunity to Joshua for him to lead his people. So with that, let's look at Joshua chapter 1. This is such a familiar passage, Um, but it's so good. Joshua chapter 1. Now, again, we have the setting. Moses is dead, and he's led them right up to the Jordan. And so we see here in verse 7, God tells Joshua, Be strong and very courageous. Be very careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. So just based on verse 7, how is Joshua to be strong and courageous? Verse 7 gives us the answer. How is he to be strong and courageous? By doing what? What's that? Yes, yes, obey the instructions. Be very careful to obey the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from the left nor to the right. Then you will be successful in everything you do. It's not as if Joshua was trusting within his own might or in himself. And God understood that Joshua left to himself didn't have the ability, didn't have the power, didn't have the authority to lead his people and to take the land. But rather what God does, he says, look, you follow me, you follow my word, you believe in my word, you trust in me, and we're going to take this land together. 
I will deliver the enemies into your hands. So he says, going on in verse 8, study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so that you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. This is my command. And this is his command to each one of us. We are not failures. We are not defeated. We are more than conquerors through Christ. This is my command. Say it with me. Be strong and courageous. Now, guys, uh -uh. we're going to do this together. You ready? We're going to do this like we believe it. Here we go. Be strong and courageous. That's the command. Be strong and courageous. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. That's the command. Do not be. What is tempting you in your life that is causing you to be afraid? To be filled with fear. Fear is a real real problem for all of us. It's a real temptation for each of us. Anxiety, all of this. Discouragement, depression, all of that is, is, is right there. But God tells us, do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. That's why Joshua can be courageous. Not because Joshua is this mighty warrior. Joshua is probably at least 80 years old here. 70 years old. And God is telling him to be courageous. To be strong. But not based off of Joshua's might. But because of God. He says in the latter part of 9. Do not be afraid, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. How is God with him wherever he goes? It's by studying the book. The book of instruction, continually. Meditate on it day and night so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. How do we know that God is with us when we obey him? He's with us. So Joshua was preparing to lead God's people through a transition to receive God's promises. And these promises that God had given to Joshua's people were huge. They had long anticipated them. They had been waiting for about 600 years before this time. But what was true 40 years ago for Joshua and Israel was true then. There were still giants in the land. The people of Canaan didn't shrink in that 40-year period. So stop for a moment and think about your life. Now, when you came in here, we were probably, we are all probably facing giants. I want you to think about those giants that stand before you right now. And I just want us to take a moment and to just pray about about this, about these giants in our lives. And I want us to just claim victory over them, not by your might, not by your power, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. By the name of Jesus Christ, declare victory over those giants. What giants are in your life that need slaying, that need conquering? Maybe it's the giant of parenting. Just the challenge is just too much. Maybe it's the giant of having bitterness towards someone because of what that person said and forgiving that person is just too much. Maybe that giant is is finances or, or greed or unrepentant sin, that sin that just keeps on conquering you time after time. Maybe it's the giant of really following your heart that you feel led by God, that he's calling you to do something, but because you can't see the bottom, you're afraid to jump. What is your giant? And do you have faith that God will really be with you and so that you can be courageous and not fear? Whatever the giants are, these giants are huge, relentless, powerful, taunting. 
So we are courageous by following and trusting in Christ. Trusting in God's word. The burden of proof is on God. When he says, I will be with you wherever you go, the burden of proof is on God. He's the one that made the promise. And so let's trust him and be courageous. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. Notice this. And so God tells him to be strong and courageous. And then then we see here that, that Joshua doesn't let the grass grow under his feet. Verse 10, Joshua then commanded the officers of Israel, go through the camp and tell the people to get their provisions ready. In three days, you will cross the Jordan River and take possession of the land the Lord God is giving you. We're not going to waste time. We're not going to send out some spies. We're just going to do it. Take ownership of the task that God has given you. You know, we talked about this. We're going to look at it again a little bit next week. But we talked about identifying our purpose in life or purposes in life and looking at the three things, our our experience in life, our affinity, and our passion. And then whenever you, wherever you, whenever you analyze those, your experiences in life, your, your, your um, affinity, those things that you have common interest in, and those things that you're passionate about, those things that your heart gets excited about, or, or those things that your heart is, bro- or is broken over, wherever those three areas intersect, that's probably a good indication of what your purpose is in life. And decide what to be and go be it. Just go do it and, and be done with it and just trust that God's going to, going to make the way where there seems to be no way. Look, I, look, if we all stood there on the same boat with Peter and, and, and Peter was getting ready to go out when he said, Jesus, if it's really you, tell me to come out and talk and come out and walk to you on this water. What would we think if we saw Peter taking that other step out of the boat? What would we think? He's crazy. He's crazy. It's probably what the world thinks about us, too. At least, listen, the world should think that about us. Because we should be stepping out of the boat all the time, testing the water, experiencing the power and the faithfulness of Jesus. I'm learning this myself. A little confession time here. I, I'm, I'm, believe it or not, I know you might find this hard to believe because I get up and I speak each week. But what I do here each week is not easy for me. Um, I'm the type personality, I would be very content to do what John Van Ostrom does every Sunday. And thank you so much, John, for helping keep us safe back there, our, sec- our uh, security guy, our door watcher. But uh, to stand in the back and just ob- observe. But it's by the power and grace of God that I'm able to just get up here and do this. But there's another more recent example. Um, over the past six or seven months, I've just... I've been challenged to just, we would say, come out of my shell. To, to just let God's light shine through me. So I've been a little bit more vocal, a little bit more present, even on social media, a little bit more sociable, even to strangers out, out in the community. And, and just this past week, even, um, I'm part of this uh, Montclair fishing group on Facebook. And um, one guy reached out and just said, hey, any of you guys... Uh, on those rainy days that we can't go fishing, any of you guys want to get together and play some small stakes poker? And I scrolled on down, scrolled on down. I was like, oh, I really need to comment on that. And finally, you know, I just commented because I look at it as an opportunity to make relationships, to establish relationships in hopes that this guy will eventually host a, po- a poker game and I can go and win their money and then lead them to Jesus. I mean... I can see the book. I mean, there's a book waiting to be written about that, a pastor playing poker. But, but it's just those small little things that, that God has been working in me to be bold and courageous, not because there's something great in Kevin, but it allows me an opportunity to really experience the greatness of God, the faithfulness of God. Listen to what I'm saying. As we look at Scripture to see how we can conquer and how we acquire valor and strength and victory. Success isn't for us to psychoanalyze how we can have our best life now. It's not about us really having our best life now, though I believe that if we are courageous and if we are walking with God, we will have our best life. But the thing is, God recognizes, as he recognized in Joshua, as he recognized in Moses and, and, and Abraham and all these other leaders, God recognizes our frailty. 
our incapability. So he comes and provides the answer. He says to all of us, look to me, trust in me, and I will make you successful. I, God says, will make you victorious. I will make you better and enable you to carry out your task. So if you have a task ahead of you, look to God because he will deliver success into your hands. Listen, this is a true story. I was um, preparing my message and and I hadn't shared where I, go, where I was going in this new series except with, with Kim. And, and I was working on this on Thursday, and I was about halfway done with it for today's message. And, and I get this text message. Now, I want you to hear this text message. I think this was God. I truly, I, I believe this was God prophesying to this guy. And listen to this. Out of the clear blue, I get this text message in the middle of my sermon. Yes, what God is waiting for is our invitation to partner with him. Here is what normal Christian thinking looks like regarding the size territory God has in mind for us. And this is probably where most of us are. I know this is where I have been in the past. Is, here's, our, here's our Christian math. My abilities, notice all of the personal pronouns, my. My abilities, my experience, plus my training, plus my personality and appearance, plus my expectations of others equals my assigned uh, my assigned territory. In other words, it's all focused on self. My appearance, it's all based on, it's all dependent on my experience. It's all dependent on my abilities. And you know how big my my territory is going to be if I depend on all of those things? It'll be about a three foot circumference because that's about how far I can physically reach. Thank you for that, brother. But then he goes on, the text goes on and says, God specializes in partnering with normal people. Joshua was a normal guy. He specializes in partnering with normal people. Billy Graham was an old cow farmer. We have more education than than Joshua, than Billy, and, and any others that God has worked through. But that's the kind of people that God wants to work through because he will not share his glory with another. He won't share his glory with another. If he's going to do something great in you and through you, you better have the heart to give him all the glory, to give him all the praise and all the credit. He goes on, God specializes in partnering with normal people who believe in a supernormal God who will do his work through them. As we ask or beg God for more influence and responsibility with which to honor him, he will bring opportunities and people right into our path. Here it is. Fear, and he had it in all caps, fear will hit you as your territory is being enlarged, but also the thrill of God carrying carrying you along as you do it. Listen, anything that's worth doing, anything that you've been praying for, anything that you're longing for, there will be those times that you will have fear. Fear is a real emotion. Sometimes God allows to present that fear so that you will trust in God. God, don't you know that the Israelites and Joshua had to have butterflies in their stomach? Being courageous isn't isn't, isn't absent of fear. Being courageous or being brave is doing something that even though there's fear, you're still going to do it because you believe it's the right thing to do. What's the right thing to do in your life? Move forward and say, God, you're you're the one that said you're going to slay this giant, so I'm going to move forward. And we're going to bowl over this giant. And then he goes on, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And I had that to say for today. It's not by our power, guys. It's by the spirit of God working in us and through us. God always intervenes when we put his agenda before our agenda and go for it. You see, the, tw- the ten spies had put their own agenda before God's agenda. Joshua was putting his, God's agenda. He saw himself as an instrument of being the one that God would use to deliver his promise of the land to his people. So what does being courageous look like? 
What does being courageous look like? Look at this. Um, 2 Corinthians 1. You know, we, we think of Paul as just this man of valor, and he was. But we think as if he had never had any challenges or, or that he never, or the, that, that fear was absent, that he never knew what it was like to be fearful or to be discouraged or to think that, that um, he wasn't going to survive or get out of whatever he was in to make it out alive. But I love Paul's authenticity here in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. If we can pull that up there. Paul says, We think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability. Paul was a, we would say Paul is a, is a man of valor. But even this man was overwhelmed beyond his own ability to endure. He, couldn't, he felt like he couldn't do it anymore. He felt like he was running out of gas. And we thought we would never live through it. How many of us are like that? In fact, he says, not only did we not expect to live through it, we expected to die. But as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves. Isn't that the, the story of Christianity? Isn't that the story of God's people? Stop relying on yourself. <laughs> hey, 10 spies, stop relying on yourself. Inspire Church, stop relying on yourself. Kevin Griggs, stop relying on yourself and just step out and rely on Jesus. Jesus, if that is you, if you're calling me to do that, call me out of this boat because I want to walk on this water. But as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned. It's a process, guys. It's a process. To, we learned to rely on God who raises the dead. Listen, I don't care what you're facing. Nothing is too, too big for God. By the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, it's the same exact power, the power of the Holy Spirit that is living in you. And he did rescue us from mortal danger and he will rescue us again. This is what courageous courage looks like. We have placed our confidence in him and he will continue to rescue us. If you have your Bibles, underline that. We have placed our confidence in him. Man, may, isn't that kind of Inspired Church's anthem? We have placed our confidence in him and he will continue to rescue us. I'm sure each of us could probably stand today and testify and give God the, great, uh, the glory about how he has continue time and again to rescue us. Whatever it is, whatever it has been that we've, we've been facing. But faith and hope, if you read this, you notice that Paul has this faith and hope that are necessary ingredients for courage. Faith in the Lord Jesus and hope that God's word is true and that he will deliver. And so, therefore, you can have the courage to step out and move forward. Not at all am I comp comparing my trials to Paul's. I don't know the suffering that, and I, and I hope I'll never know the suffering that Paul faced. But I know what he's talking about. Even as the pastor of this church, there was a time I didn't know what was up or down. Not just as a pastor, but as, as a child of God. Times I didn't know if I would even have a church to pastor. But people were praying. People were encouraging. And most of all, people were hoping and trusting that God has got this, that God is leading us. Yeah, there are giants ahead of us and there are still some giants ahead of us, but in Spire Church, we are not slowing down. God's going to slay those giants and he's going to use us to do them. Paul says he was crushed and overwhelmed beyond his ability. That's where God oftentimes has us before he does something incredible in us. 
He wants us to step out into the deep beyond our ability, into the deep where we can't stand, into the deep where we can't even bob up and down. He wants us to step out into the deep so that it's beyond our abilities, so that we will learn to rely on him. Paul indeed had his giants. Are you there? We are more than conquerors. Jesus reigning on high, but he had to go through hell to get there. Oftentimes we have our own hell that we have to go through so that we can experience the sweetness of victory, so that we can experience the faithfulness of God, the power of God. And so as we go, as we move forward, we we can kind of be a little timid and that's all right. But as long as we're moving forward, we're moving. We go in his name. We do by his power. We live by his authority. And Satan and all the forces of darkness and all their giants have no reign or authority over us. If you don't give it to them. What are the giants in our lives that need slaying? What if you were courageous over those giants today? What if Joshua chose not to be courageous? Would the people experience the land flowing with milk and honey? No one knows, but I'm convinced we're going to go to our graves and some giants were not, could have been slain, but weren't because we were not courageous. That giant who taunts us as we're faced with the opportunity to be courageous and sharing the good news about Jesus to the person God has laid on our hearts. Some, listen, there's somebody here that God has laid on, heavily on your heart to go and share the good news of Jesus, whether it's at work or in your neighborhood, and you haven't done it yet because you're too timid. And God is telling you to step out and to to pray, to step out and to go and share the gospel. What if we chose to be courageous? What if we chose to be courageous, trusting that God is with us and turning over to him whatever we've been carrying? What I'm about to do is unlike what I've done in the past. But I'm going to ask you to be courageous. Publicly confess that giant that's in your life. I shared mine earlier. What giant that you're having a hard time just conquering or timid to go and confront, to approach, whatever that giant is. Not just to confess it, but so that we are going to pray over you and pray victory over you that God would slay the giant through you. Of course, when you think about this, you you can't help but think about the story of of, um, David. And what's the other character's name? What's his name? Goliath, that's right. You can't help but think about that, that story. And, um, I thought it was in 1 Samuel. Where David, his father, Jesse, sends David, young David, probably 13, 14 years old, to send him out to, to feed his brothers because they are in a battle with the Philistines. And David walks up onto the scene with King Saul and, and his men all panicked because they have this giant, Goliath, and they don't know what to do. How many, this is, it's kind of funny, but, but this is so re- reality for all of us. We all have Goliaths in our life. And we don't, sometimes we, 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 we worry, we stay up late at night, we overeat. We drink too much. We do all these things that aren't good for us. And all the while, God says to us, look to me. Don't look to your armor. Some of us, our armor is eating. Some of, our, some of us, our armor, our, uh, Saul's armor is, is lashing out in anger. Some of us, our armor is lack of sleep, medication, 
alcohol, drugs, whatever it might be. And God at the end of the day is saying, look to me. And David's walking up on the scene and saying, what is this? What is this Goliath, this giant taunting us and making fun of our God? And David's like, the Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. All right, Saul says, go ahead. And may the Lord be with you because he apparently is not with me. Then Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet and a coat of, of, of mail. David put it on, strapped the sword over it and took a step or two to see what it was like for he had never worn such things before. I can't go in these, David said. He protested to Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off again. He picked up five smooth stones from a stream and put them into his shepherd's bag, then armed only with his shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistines. He's moving forward. David doesn't quite know how this is going to go down. He just knows that he's going in the name and in the power of Jesus Christ or in the name and the power of God. And he knows that this giant is going to go down because he has faith and he has hope. He's moving forward. Goliath walked out toward David with his shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at his ruddy face, at this ruddy faced boy. Am I a dog, he roared at David, that you come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the names of his gods. Come over here and I'll give you, fle- give you your flesh to the birds and wild animals, Goliath yelled. David replied to the Philistines, you come to me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies. That's the name. That's the banner that we march under. That's the banner that we live under. The God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied, today the Lord will conquer you and I will kill you and cut off your head. That's one of the first Bible stories I taught Jaden. Jaden, you remember that? Good answer. David cutting off the head of Goliath and holding it up. Man, it's so true. That's what God is calling us to do. As Goliath moved closer to attack David, quick, David quickly ran out to meet him, reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out a stone and hurled it into his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in and the Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone for he had no sword. Then David ran over and pulled Goliath's sword from his sheath. David used it to kill him and cut off his head. Some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. So you have an opportunity today. When you walk out those doors, will you be a David? Will you be a Saul? Will you be a Joshua and Caleb? Or will you be... The ten spies. Today we, we will be one of, the, one of the two. And what if? However, you walked out of here and lived this week, not knowing how it was all going to go down, but you lived this week with just courage, faith, and hope in God, and you lived like David. You lived like Joshua. So what giants do you need slaying in your life, trusting in Him. Let's pray. Father, I thank You for Your precious Word, and I thank You, God, for um, just giving us the Word of, of admonition in the story of Joshua. God, I know that we all have giants, and and Father, that sometimes those giants just keep coming back. Time after time, we think we've conquered it, and they just keep coming back. And so, God, I pray over the people here right now. I pray over each one here, God, who's ever facing these giants, Lord, that you would give them that faith and that hope to be courageous, and that, God, that they would look to you to slay the giant. God, that they would confess whatever that giant is, and, Lord, that you would, would, would demonstrate your power in slaying the giant, God, that you would bring salvation and and success into their hands, whatever it is, God. 
Lord, you're the reason why we can be brave. You're the reason why we can renounce Satan and, and declare victory over him and, 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 and flush him out of our lives and out of our environment. It is by your power and authority. So God, we thank you for that. We thank you for being with us wherever we go. God, I pray that you would show up here in this time of worship. In Jesus' name.